Hi, I'm your host, Dee Dee Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Sound Isolation with Matt Azevedo. Matt presented this talk in April of 2017 at the Audio Builders Workshop event, DIY Acoustics. Nearly 50 people attended the eight-hour event to learn about acoustics from some of the best minds in Boston. Matt works with Ascentech and is the creator of their 3D listening software platform. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. Hi. I'm Matt Azevedo. I'm a staff scientist here at a, at a Centec. Um, I run a mastering studio down in Providence. Uh, the, the thing Owen was alluding to, uh, the kind of my, my, my specialty here is acoustic simulation. Uh, so there's this nine channel, the ninth channel's up above that grate there, uh, hemispherical uh, speaker array that we use for doing uh, 3D ambisonic uh, predictions of how spaces will sound before they're built. So we can take various design options, uh, model them, and then let you hear the various design options uh, in 3D before you build it. Uh, but today, I am talking about sound isolation and why you will come to hate it. Uh, so when Owen was putting this together, uh, I looked at the list of topics and I said, oh, no one's talking about sound isolation. You can't talk about you know, studio acoustics and not talk about sound isolation. Someone has to do it and I will take the fall. <laughs> because sound isolation is no fun. You know, if you spend like $20,000 on big fancy speakers and you put them in your studio and you look and go, wow, speakers. <laughs> if you spend $20,000 on sheetrock, it doesn't have that same kind of visceral thrill <laughs> that blinky lights do. Um, and sound isolation is horrifically expensive to do well. Uh, so we run into a lot of excitement with clients uh, who want you know, to hear nothing in a space. And then we tell them what hearing nothing costs and they get very angry and they say, can't we just put some fuzz on the walls? <laughs> and then we say, no. So, quick bit of math for anyone who is not down with math. Um, we're going to be talking about decibels a lot, and decibels are a logarithmic scale. So in your traditional linear scale, the step size is always the same. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 plus 1 is 5. Every step is the same size. In a logarithmic scale, the proportion is the same size. So in this case, the step is 1 times 5 is 5, 5 times 5 is 25, 25 times 5 is 125. So every step has the same proportion instead of the same size. Uh, it turns out all of your senses, your eyes, your skin, your ears, are all calibrated logarithmically the response curve is in proportional change, not absolute change, which leads to some exciting and interesting issues. So if you wanted to you know, calculate decibels, if you're dealing with power, it's the logarithm of a ratio times 10. That's the deci is the times 10. If you're dealing with pressure, it's the pressure squared over the reference pressure squared times 10 log. But you can factor that two out. So, you, so pressure is basically 20 log the pressure. What this means is if you have 10 times the power, you get a 10 decibel increase in level. So if you go from 100 watts of power to 1,000 watts of power, you get 10 dB louder. And conversely, it works the other way. If you go from 100 watts of power to 10 watts of power, 1 tenth, you get 10 dB softer. If you double the power, you only get 3 dB. So for every guitarist that has ever said, a 50 watt amp just cannot reproduce what I am doing here. I need a 100 watt amp. The difference there is three decibels. 
Now pressure, because it's the 20 log, a 10 times increase in pressure is plus 20 dB. And a doubling of pressure is 6. That's the math. Here we have a partition. And this partition has on one side of it a 100 decibel sound source. And this partition blocks 99% of the sound energy, which is a lot, right? <coughs> Only 1% of the sound energy is going through. On this side, it's 60. So blocking 99% of the energy is, you know, blocking 90% is one-tenth. So you get a 20 dB decrease in sound pressure because it's a logarithm. Blocking 99% is one-tenth of one-tenth. So you get a 20 dB for the first one-tenth, and then a second 20 decibels for the second one-tenth. So it's still 60 dB, is, that's about how loud I'm talking right now. So if this is your control room, and you've got your guitarist with this 100 watt amplifier rocking out in the control room, it's still this loud on the other side of the, on the, other side of the partition, which is still loud. So what do we do, right? What would you obviously do? You make the wall bigger, right? We're going to make the wall twice as thick. Big, beefy, beefy wall. How much quieter does it get on that side? Six. Because when you cut the pressure in half, you get a six dB decrease. So we've gone from a big thick wall to a twice as thick wall, and we've only gotten six decibels. This sucks. <laughs> and if we make this four times as thick, we get another six decibels. And if we make it eight times as thick, we get another six decibels. You know, if we made it 10 times as thick as the first wall, that would get us another one-tenth. So after a 10 times thickness wall, you would get down to 40 decibels on the other side. It's still not very good. And now you have a wall that's this thick. Throw. What? Throw. Yeah. Uh, and the floor collapses. And the floor collapses. <laughs> There's a point where structural engineering comes into play. Um, please consult a licensed structural engineer. Uh, so what else can we do? This clearly doesn't help us much. What if we do two of the same wall instead of one wall twice as thick? What happens now? It doubles the isolation because look what's happening. There's sound energy in the air that's incident on this wall and that vibrates the wall and the vibration travels through the wall to this side where it re-radiates into the air. And that re-radiated re sound hits the next wall where it travels through again. And then is re-radiated here. So if you have two you know, theoretically perfect, separate, completely, utterly separate walls, you get the sum of the isolation of both partitions. There's a heavy caveat to completely, utterly separate. Because generally, you have to build the wall onto something. We get this magic called flanking paths. Now, what a flanking path is, any transmission of sound that's not through the wall. So some of this sound hits the floor and travels through the floor of the building and comes up on the other side. If you have, say, an air duct that connects these two, you blow all your sound isolation. The sound just goes up one, comes down the other. It's like putting a big hole in it. Because think about it, if you put a hole that big in a wall, you're not blocking 99% anymore. Now you're blocking like 95%. And no matter how thick you make that wall, you're only blocking 95, it'll never get better. So this is the primary problem of sound isolation. You know, it's easy to do if you can have 
infinite planes that are totally decoupled and have no connection to each other at any point in infinity, sound isolation is easy. Building things that are actually, you know, will not make your structural engineer cry, that get you sound isolation is a lot harder. So when we talk about sound isolation, the number, one of the main metrics we use is transmission loss. And it's very simple. It's the level on the source minus the level on the receiver. It's kind of funny because you go to grad school to be an acoustician and you do like crazy calculus and then you get a job as an acoustician and it's subtraction. <laughs> Bizarre but true fact. Um, so I do a lot of subtraction for a living. And when you subtract those two levels, you get the transmission loss of the partition. So here we got some real partitions, real actual test data partitions, half inch sheet of drywall. Now here in, in, in fancy land, drywall is technically like Kleenex, it's a brand name. So the fancy people call it gypsum wallboard. But drywall, <laughs> half inch of drywall, just floating in the air will get you an STC of 28. Now an STC is an, is a, 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 an average that's calculated in a stupid way but that we won't get into because we only have so much time of the transmission loss at many different frequencies. So we get 28 from a one piece of drywall. What do we get from two pieces of drywall? Who's following along at home? Two pieces of drywall. Right, we're doubling. So you would think 34. Beautiful. 31. What the heck? Where did our other 3 dB go? We paid good money for that 3 dB. We paid twice as much money as before for that 3 dB. We don't have our 3 dB. Well, the problem is that walls are complicated. As, you, as soon as you start having lots of physical objects that are resonating in different ways, that nice, clean, predictable 6 dB per doubling goes away. So for a real wall versus frequency, most of your bandwidth is roughly 6 dB per octave. Now what's an octave? a doubling of frequency. So as you double the frequency and have the wavelength, you double the isolation at that particular frequency. At some point, you start getting longitudinal, longitudinal resonances in the panel and you get little holes. At very low frequencies, the stiffness of the panel, how hard the panel is, controls your isolation. And at some point, there's the, you know, the pitch, that, the ringing, like you, you know, uh, wine glass resonance of that wall. And you get a big hole. So what's happening is as you go from this one piece of drywall to two pieces of drywall, you have not only doubled the mass, but you've changed the resonance. It's now heavier, so that resonance is going to slide further down in the spectrum that you're measuring and put the, the resonance in a weaker part of the isolation. And that's where that extra 3 dB went. Now, if we take, what were our numbers here? So 28, if we do two pieces of drywall with an air gap between them, we get 33. We got back 2 dB that we lost from that doubling. But we're still, you know, I, I just told you that. That's just something together. You should get 50 from that. But the resonances of, of, the, of the physical object are creating weaknesses that punch holes in that theoretically perfect doubling of isolation. Now, who's ever built a wall? There you go. What's missing here? 
studs. These are just two panels of drywall mystically suspended in space with nothing holding them up. When you put studs in, oh, oh dang, there's one missing. Where did the one that was missing go? Oh, well. Oh, you know, we can, we, we can work around this. So, we now have two different resonances. We've got the resonance of the panel and the resonance of this air gap and then the resonance of the next panel. So we have another hole in our spectrum, which is why we're getting, you know, such a minuscule increase. So we can put insulation, we can put fuzzy stuff into the air gap. And putting fuzzy stuff in the air gap damps the resonance of the airspace. And now that we've damped that airspace resonance, we got 45. We're almost at that like perfect theoretical summing of the two panels. But as we said, there ain't no studs in this wall, which is not a good way to build a wall. Back to structural engineering. Go to school for structural engineering. It'll be so much easier with the rest of your life than whatever you're doing now. You just look at drawings and you hate yourself because the architect doesn't want to do things that match physics. Wonderful life. So you put some studs in and we, we just lost six points. We're down at 39 now. Where have our six points gone? So before it was a panel resonating and then re-radiating re into the gap and then another panel. Now we've anchored these panels together. So instead of having to re-radiate through the air, this panel is mechanically coupled to this panel. So when you shake one side, it mechanically shakes the other with no right re-radiation. So we lose half our isolation because we put studs in the wall. Wow. So what you want to do is break that mechanical connection. One way you can do it is by adding something resilient into the wall, something to make the, ooh, dang, I got strings on me. Uh, so if you go in the toy box here. So the cheapest way to decouple a wall is this stuff. This is called resilient channel. And the way this works, you put it against the stud and you screw the channel into the stud. And then you put the drywall up and you screw the drywall into the channel. And because this has holes in it and it's only anchored at one end, this is floppy. Right, so, so, this, th so it doesn't necessarily absorb the vibration, but it weakens the mechanical connection between this side of the wall and this side of the wall. Oh, so the transmission from any vibrations come from that. Yeah. So, in, so some of that energy that would re-radiate now gets turned into wobbliness in the channel. And that gets us back up to 46. We're even better now. There's a lot of ways you can do this. This is the cheap way. Um, the funny thing about resilient channel is people install it. And... Uh, so you're installing it, right? You get it against the stud. You screw it right here into the stud. Perfect. And then you're coming by and screwing the drywall in. And you do it on the same spacing because that's the easiest way. So you screw it right back into the stud. Your channel is now not resilient. Um, there's some interesting things about multifamily residences and fire code. To keep the fire rating of the, say, the, the ceiling it needs to be continuous. You can't have holes in it. So what they do, but they need, you know, isolation from the upstairs neighbors. So they hang the ceiling on this stuff. Works this way too. And they run it across the whole floor of the building. Just a giant expanse of, of, of drywall. And then they build the walls that go in between up against this. Because if they cut a hole in it, that blows your fire rating. So they can't do that, so they just build the wall to here, which makes it so this doesn't flop anymore. And now it doesn't work. 
one of the, one of the joys of working in acoustics is going to construction sites and then going. <laughs> now, if you want to do this better, we got these kind of guys. This is a, a resilient clip. So what you do is you shoot this into the stud, and then you take a piece of hat channel, and the hat channel snaps into your resilient clip, and then you screw the drywall into here. This is steel, so if you're screwing up, you're not gonna put a, uh, a drywall screw through this. It's not even long enough, you won't get to the wall. So these kind of things offer you a much better likelihood that the wall will actually work. It's not even bang for your buck. It's, it's actually working. You know, the, the, this kind of, oh yeah. Which goes where? So, this guy, this piece here, here's a hole through the rubber grommet. That gets screwed into the stud. Okay. And then you snap channel into that. And then, and then you screw the drywall into the channel. Yeah, that's a clip. And the other one was a channel? Yeah. Uh, but we can do better than this. I was looking at channels, pfft, baby stuff. What we've got, when we're serious, are two separate walls, a double stud wall. So instead of having one wall with a floppy layer of drywall on it, we build two walls, which are, you know, this is another thing is that you, the, you will often go to job sites and you know, for bracing, people will go through and tack these together. And then we, we, we do this at the job site. But if you have two separate walls, you get everything in the package. You've got you know, some fuzz, you get some fuzz, you've got an air gap, I mean the air gap really goes from here to here, the fuzz is, is acoustically invisible. And then nothing's connected, you get 59, that's pretty great. But we need more. We want more sound isolation than this. So what can we do to get more? Well, it's a funny thing, if you add a resilient channel on here, you've, you already have broken the connection. So making this floppy when it's not connected doesn't change anything. But what we, mass, we can add mass, we can make the wall heavier. So we add more drywall to the wall, right? We make two walls. You know, put another layer of drywall in there. One layer of drywall is 59. You put two more layers of drywall in, it's 44. What the heck? It, well, the, what, why did we lose isolation by increasing mass? Well, not say a resonant channel, but here, the air gap is this deep. The panels are actually like a foot apart. Not a foot, what's, four inches, four inches, one inch, nine inches apart, there you go. Oh, I'd hate to give you false numbers. Now, ooh. The panels are only one inch apart. So since you have this captured air between the two walls, it's stiff. It's stiff because it's constrained, it's constrained into a small place. So now this bit of air is so tight that it's coupling the two sides together. You know, it's not, a, you know, it's not mechanical in the sense of it's a piece of metal, but you have this stiff pillow of air pushing on the other one. So you effectively get mechanical coupling between both walls. Now if we take that and put that drywall on the outside, same amount of drywall, but now we're maintaining that nine inch depth. And we're up to 63. This is a good wall. I like this kind of wall. Fine wall. Now at this point, you're uh, things start getting ugly. Because this is like, you, you've gone from, you know, where, where, where is our first wall? 
uh, the, the good old basic wall of cements, 39, and we've beefed the heck out of it. We've gone up to 63. Wonderful improvement. Yeah, so now it's a nine inch air gap and then an inch of drywall, inch thick slab of drywall on each side. So we could make the wall heavier, but that's going to mean four layers of drywall on each side, which is a really expensive wall. Or you can go to metal studs. Metal studs, because they flex, have some more flex to them, they're not as stiff as wood studs. You get a little bit out of that. But once you get this far, the rest of the, everything is just a game of inches. You're, you're throwing as much mass and money as you can trying to improve this, but there just isn't that much. I mean, the next thing you do is, is increase the air gap. That's the next big thing you can do. So your wall goes from being this thick to being this thick to being this thick. Yep. Are there any other choices for the mass besides the gypsum? Uh, anything you want. You could say build two walls out of uh, grouted solid eight inch concrete blocks painted on both sides so they're airtight. Um, that'll do better. But if you're looking at it from an FEA perspective, you want to have, you want to have a damper. You want to absorb and, and turn it into heat. Well, you can do some, you can, there's some more tricks you can do. Like you can take this and then spend an inordinate amount of money on green glue, green glue. What does green glue do? Um, Cost sixteen dollars a tube. It takes two tubes per sheet of drywall. This is why we hate sound isolation. Um, now, what this will do in, 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 a, in a, that first wall with a single stud, all of a sudden you've got a lot more resilience, so it makes a big difference. But once you've gotten to here. All the damping does is takes that resonant hole and makes it smaller. Instead of having a tight, deep resonance, you end up getting a wider, shallower resonance, which is especially helpful at low frequency. So you can take this wall, put $32 per sheet of uh, drywall in between those two layers, and you'll pick up a few points at low frequencies. And if you're worrying about like kick drums, picking up a few points at low frequencies can be something you're really excited about. But for 32 bucks per, you know, four by eight sheet of drywall, you get a few points at low frequencies. Everything from here is just inches. You know, I've done studios with, you can do things like different thicknesses of walls, like Four, four sheets on one side, five on the other. So now, the, now each panel has a different coincidence frequency. So you get less through, through there. But it all gets ugly fast. And it forgets about the flanking paths. Because now you have this wall that's this thick and weighs 4,000 pounds and has a three foot air gap. And the sound goes into the floor and it runs across and it comes back up. And life is horrible again. So when you're looking at things like test cells, recording studios, anything where you need super high sound isolation, you can't stop at decoupling the walls. You have to decouple everything. You, know, you need to make the studio a box that is floating on some kind of springy things inside the rest of the structure, which is extremely expensive. So we got, we got some toys here. Um, let's say you want to isolate a ceiling, but you don't want to spend, uh, but you want something better than resilient clips. These guys are really neat. Some wave called a wave hanger. And they're cheap and they work really well. I, I'm very excited about these guys when I get to use them. And the channel sits in there. And the weight of the drywall, once it's installed, pulls this spring down, and then the ceiling's floating. And these are cheaper than these. And they work better, which is pretty cool. But that only works so well. If you want to get better than that, you need to start hanging the whole ceiling on a spring. 
So you put a piece of hanging wire in here and a piece of hanging wire there. One end goes to the ceiling, one end goes to uh, strips of a uh, of channel. The weight pulls the little spring down, there's a little spring between there, and you get some isolation. You get, it's better. I just couldn't see it. Oh yeah, there you go. But that's only so good, and it's only good at so many frequencies, such as a certain frequency range. So if you need better, then you can move to this kind of a thing, where you've got a nice big rubber grommet, and you hang the ceiling below that, you get more isolation. And if that's not good enough, you get a big spring with some extra rubbery damping layers in, uh, on, the, on the bolts, so the bolt connection is now damped. And this gives you even more isolation. Uh, there was a studio I worked on that was on the top floor of a building, big flat roof. And you know what it does sometimes? rains. And if you've ever been in a building like this with a big flat roof and it starts raining, <laughs> holy cow, that's a lot of impact energy on your roof. So uh, they were doing stuff that couldn't be interrupted. It, you know, that the, the cost of having to redo things was really substantial. So what we did was we did nice, nice springs. Now the really good ones of these are 80 bucks a piece. And you're putting them, depending on how thick the ceiling is, every maybe 10 feet on center, maybe less. So now you have all those other costs. Now you're adding every like two pieces of drywall, you're adding an $80 hanger on top of that. So our ceiling's bouncy now. That's great. We've got a bouncy ceiling. But there's a floor. Uh, one thing you can do. This is, this is a handy product that comes all put together and all ready for you, where it's a piece of plywood and fluff. Everyone loves fluff. And these little com compressed fiberglass blocks. So you can put that down and you build your floor on it. Now your floor's got some squish to it. But even that doesn't work very well. You need some mass. So you maybe, you do this, and then you pour three or four inches of concrete on top of this to get more mass, to get better sound isolation. Uh, that same studio with the ceiling thing, uh, there's no way to get like a concrete truck feed into the studio, because it's in the middle of a big building. So instead of using concrete, we ended up having to use gypboard. So we just took drywall and put four inches of drywall into the floor to get enough mass to get the sound isolation we needed. Um, I think the total dry, so that's just like a control room and a live room, very basic studio. I think we spent $60,000 on just sheetrock. Just the sheetrock budget was 60, I mean, not counting the, the studs, the resilient things, we did some fancy stuff in there. Just. 60 grand of drywall. Uh, well, this is wood. Um, it's just plywood. And then you would put something heavy. Now, you could put more wood on top of it, and that's cheap. You could pour concrete on top of it. That's more expensive, but it's heavier, so that's better. It's stiffer. Or, if you can't pour concrete, I mean, drywall is also known as plasterboard. I mean, it's, it's basically just like sheets of, of hardened plaster. So you can just lay a bunch of that down, and it's like, like putting down concrete. But it's, you know, incredibly expensive and labor intensive, and it doesn't level itself. If you use like mortar, like the stuff you use to lay the tiles, so like good layers of that. La layers of what? Mortar. Oh, mortar. Well, you, you could do, you, you, if you wanted to, you could come in and put in like four inches of tile. That would work too. But, uh, I think at that point, you're probably just going to want to figure out a way to get a concrete truck in there, because you're going to hate your life if you're putting up four, putting four inches of tile onto a thing. Well, if you want to spend a load of money, you use quiet rock, which is more massive, much heavier, basically sheet rock that has a lot more mass to it, plus, the, the, plus the, the cost. The thing about quiet rock, quiet rock is basically heavy, thick sheet rock that has green glue built into it. It costs about five times, would you say that's about ballpark? About five times what regular sheetrock costs. But 
one 5 8 inch, you know, standard sheet of quiet rock is not as good as two standard 5 8 inch sheets of regular stuff. So you can double your cost and make the wall thicker and get better re results than having five times the cost and having quiet rock. Now you do get the built in damping. So if you need that last couple of boop at low frequencies, maybe that makes sense. Or if you really need that like extra acid sheet. That, um, I've seen that happen. It, it does yeah. happen. Especially if you're talking about multiple layers where you don't have a lot of ceiling height. Like well, the thing, the place we've been seeing it is, I mean, any, anyone been down to Fort Point in the last 10 years? There you go. It's nothing but, I mean, it, it's just like, it's the waterfront. It, it's sprouting skyscrapers like they're spore based or something. They just keep popping out of the ground. Um, and we're working on a lot of those. We're working on most of those. And the apartments in those places are selling for two and three and four million dollars a piece. And you sell that kind of thing by the square foot. So if you make your, if you, if you figure your, your apartment's selling for maybe like $1,000 a square foot, and then you're shaving off that much thickness all the way around the whole apartment, that adds up. That adds up faster than the cost of quiet rock. Wow. So we've had architects who are super aggressive that the walls have to be as thin as possible to maximize square footage they can sell. But you still have to meet building code. And not only do you have to meet building code, which is STC 50, if you're paying, if it's STC 50 and someone's like blasting Freebird next door, you're gonna hear that. If someone and their partner are not getting along, you're gonna hear that. God forbid someone has a baby, because if there's STC 50 wall between you and a baby, you ain't sleeping. Uh, so the expectations of a million dollar condo are you're going to have STC 60, STC 70 between units, which is a lot of money. Um, but it's a million dollar condo, so people do this stuff. Uh, one thing, I mean, have you, have you seen the tower that's gone up uh, right next to North Station? All the windows on the north side of that, so there's, there's apartments and stuff up there. The windows all look directly down into the smokestacks of the trains idling at North Station. The, each of those windows is like that thick. There's a thick layer of glass, a small air gap, a thick layer of laminated glass, a big air gap, and another layer of laminated glass. Those windows are five grand each. Is there a product name associated with it? No, all that stuff's custom. All this stuff, you have to like find someone and say, we want a, a windows built. That's why they're five grand each. Um, but it's like 90 decibels outside those windows because there's friggin' tr diesel engines idling right. Not even like, normally you see a diesel train and it's right there and you're like, oh wow, that's loud. This is looking right into the smokestack. <laughs> loud. And you're paying like seven grand a month to rent this apartment. You don't want to hear the train. So all those, so I mean, next time you're coming down 93, look at that building, look at those windows, and think $5,000 for each assembly. Yeah. How much, how big is um, Because, so three layer walls are a whole sticky situation because you're getting both, you're getting two sets of air resonances and you're lowering the overall air gap between the outsides. So there's two smaller air gaps, so you get less low frequency isolation. And you've got double, a double set of resonances, so wherever that dip is, is now bigger because you've stacked a resonance on a resonance. Um, the way you get around that is having vastly different depths. So if you have a half inch plate of glass 
and then an inch of air, and then a half inch plate of laminated glass, that behaves as one thing. And then you have like an eight inch air gap, and then another half inch, is an inch of laminated glass. Now they folk behave as two separate ones. To, to do it as just a, a, a double partition would have been like three inch slabs of laminated glass, which weigh so much. Um, I mean, they, they weigh so much that it's dangerous to have them on the side of a building up that high. Uh, so we don't, we can't do that. So the way you, yeah. Are, are the size of the air gaps in that kind of case, are they tuned to, hey, these are the two biggest problems that we have with the environment, let's get rid of those, or is it more, are there other things? Or, um, Math and acoustics is a funny thing. <laughs> uh, there are so many variables between, from the kind of caulking you use to seal the glass into place to the specific density of that batch of glass from that day from the factory to the humidity when it's assembled to do you fill it with air or do you fill it with argon or something like that. Um, we, we, we do everything we can to avoid specific numbers. Because, I mean, you know, because you can build the same wall and you will get a five point plus or minus variation. You can build a wall and have it come out STC 50 and build the exact same wall and it comes out 45 and build the exact same wall and it comes out 55. But they're not the exact same wall, really. They may have the same materials, but they're put together. Right. It's not the exact same wall. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, yeah, exactly, but the same construction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the same, the same screw spacing, the same everything you see a 5 dB swing in everything. So there are some cases where, I mean, when they get into control room stuff this afternoon, you, you know, you see stuff, you know, someone will hopefully talk about tuned absorbers and stuff that you can really build to do a thing at a frequency. But walls, doors, trying to say, oh yeah, we're gonna block this one tone. We just, you know, you just figure out what you actually need and then overshoot that by five points and you know you're covered. But I mean, the only way to be sure you're going to block something is to overshoot by at least five points in design. Which, you know, and as we know, six dB is a doubling. So you need to, you know, have double the pressure drop from one side of the wall to the other to be sure you're not gonna have problems. Um, so if you want floors that are fancier than that, you can take a big, so, so there's, um, this is metal here. There's a spring inside of that. So you can put these uh, <coughs> around and put a piece of wood on it, build your, you get resilience there. That, that's, that's cheap though, we're not gonna do that. If you want the good stuff, you get these and those. And a threaded rod goes through this, this cap into that socket and you put these every six, 10 feet, depending on how heavy things are. And you lay rebar across these little arms and then you pour four, what's that, four inches? Four inches of concrete on top of the whole thing. And then you wait. People get really antsy at this part because waiting costs money because all your guys are just sitting there like twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the concrete to set, but you've got to wait. And once you've waited, you then go around with the big wrench and you go to the first one of these and you give it a quarter turn. And then you go to the next one. You put your big wrench in and you give it a quarter turn. And you go back and forth all across the floor and you've now lifted the, uh, that slab up by one quarter of a thread. So you start over, you go back to the beginning, you give it a quarter turn. And you go to the next one, you give it a quarter turn. And you keep doing that until you've jacked this sucker up, you know, an inch or so. The reason you have to do it like this is because if you jack this one up all the way first, you crack the concrete. And then you have to start all over Actually, then you have to jackhammer out all the concrete and start all over. <laughs> um, 
And it's the same thing. If you try and do that before the concrete has cured, the concrete breaks. So it's, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, waiting game before that happens. But that's, that's the good way, the, you know, the serious way to isolate a floor. Yeah, man. It depends, it depends on the temperature, the humidity. Like if it's the middle of summer, the building's not closed up yet, it's super humid, it's gonna take a long time for that slab to dry out. A long time is a week? Could, you know, could be a week, week and a half, more than that-ish. But if you've got a whole construction crew sitting around waiting to get going again for a week and a half, they're just sitting there eating, drinking coffee and eating donuts, waiting for you to tell them to do something, that's a lot of money. Did I see a hand over there? Yeah. What do you call those rubber grommets? Well, I mean, this construction is called a jack-up slab. It's a jack-up floor. Um, this particular one is made by a company called Mason. Mason makes so many various kinds of springy things um, and has had the same catalog since like 1964. Uh, and they don't really publish hard numbers for anything because they know eh, it's going to be kind of a shot in the dark. So you just overbuild everything by like 6 dB, and then you'll be okay. Yeah, man. So let's have a floor to apply that to. Concrete. concrete. So this goes down. So you have a concrete floor to start with. Right. And then you put down a layer of plastic sheet. And then you put these. No, no it's just, just plastic. It's plain old plastic. And you put down a plastic sheet. And then you put these down, you attach rebar to these things to reinforce your new slab, and you pour a second slab of concrete on top of your first slab. What, they weld it on or they just sit on there? They, they, can, they just sit on there. Okay. Um, and then you're covering the whole thing in concrete. So, I mean, it's stuck on good by the time you're done. And because you put that layer of plastic down, the new concrete is not stuck to the bottom concrete which lets you jack, you know, turn the crank and jack this puppy up to get your isolation. Uh, horribly expensive. Works really good though. Yeah. So what's the problem with the concrete crack? How, how does that manifest into the like breakage? If it cracks? If it cracks, you can't like walk around on it and stuff. Like it's, the floor now does floppy things. So you have a big hole, so your airborne isolation has gone kaput because now there's a hole in the floor. And your, I mean, your impact isolation, people walking around, that'll still be pretty good. But airborne, if you've got a hole in the floor, you've got a hole in the floor. You know. Even if small cracks are enough to... Well, you know, if, if, you're, if you're for serious doing this, you want an 80 dB isolation floor. That's 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20, which means you need to block 99.99% of the energy to get 80 dB of isolation. Which means if you put a crack in that lets an extra, you know, 0 0.03, you just lost 3 dB of isolation, maybe 6. With a point, you know, 0 0.03% change in how tight that floor is. You know, a 1% change, you just blew, you know, you're now 1% off. So you have to go back all those decimal places, and now you're only getting like 40. Horrible, yeah. Was that a question or a? Oh, uh, just, just we're just we're just rocking out. That's cool. Um, and you can't just refill it with more concrete because now you're not isolated. Yeah, because now you know now the now concrete is it might drip down, and it's not gonna. And it, I mean, the idea with concrete is that when it sets, it's one solid thing. You know, two things with some schmutz in the middle to stick them together is not the same. Uh, anything? We got springs. We got. Sp it's dependent on weight, like how many of those guys you use per square yeah. foot of mm -hmm. floor. Yeah. Like with a standard hardwood floor going down on that, like how often, how many of those would you need to Well, you, you, you have to pour four inches of concrete on this. No, no, I know that. Yeah. But I'm saying if you're going to have just a wood floor on top of the concrete when you're all done, yeah. how many of those would you need, like, per? You know, you, 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 that, that's where you need to look at the, so Mason sells this part. You know, all of, you know, all of them sell this part in different stiffnesses. Um, the, the lowest isolation frequency is a function of how far this compresses. So you can figure out your lowest freq frequency of isolation 
find a spring element that compresses that distance to get that frequency of isolation and then match that to the weight of the floor assembly. Yes? With that wood one with the fiberglass, yeah. um, can you frame a room on that? Yeah, oh, okay. because that's the thing you want to do. Once you get those, those, those walls, you know, the floor floated, you want to take this, all, right, all wrong keyboard, two, two keyboards. Uh, so what you do is then you build one half of that, that double wall on the floated floor to break the floor connection between the two, which means at the perimeter, you need to put in extra ones to take the extra load of having the whole wall sitting on it. Yeah. So let's say you want to do some of these techniques to like build a, maybe a booth yep. and float it. Mm -hmm. You use these techniques in, in that manner as well? You could. You know, I mean, but I, I've, see, I've seen so many passionate efforts at sound isolation <clears throat> where people have like stuck so much drywall and stuff on their walls and then they didn't tape and seal the layers. So there's all these gaps in it. So they spent huge amounts of money on drywall, didn't seal it completely and blew like 20 dB of isolation they could have had. A great one, a great one is, well, I guess the close ones over there, po outlet boxes, power boxes. You know, if you have a power box here, and then in the next, it's easy because the, the, the wire's already there, so you put the other power box right here. Great, now you have a hole right through the wall. So you always wanna have the power boxes, or if you're doing you know, like audio pass-throughs, everything needs to be offset by at least one stud. And then you want to take that, you, there's this putty you can get for fire rated partitions, and you can seal airtight the back of that box. But, I mean, all these things cost money. So, and then if you go on the internet and you look up soundproofing, um, we never use the word soundproofing. Never, ever, 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 ever tell a client soundproof. We will talk about degrees of sound isolation, but nothing is soundproof unless you're in a hard vacuum and then you're dead, so who cares? Um, but you can go to like soundproofing.com and they will sell you all kinds of wacky crap that they promise will make it so you can't hear your neighbors. There's a consultant who has a boutique industry, big money industry, of doing like, you know the people that'll sell you $100 risers to put your speaker cables on so they don't touch the floor because that ruins the sound? Um, or like, you know, $80,000 speaker cables because, you know, the electricity knows how much you spent on the wire. Don't forget the stones you put in the CD player. The little stones, oh yeah. There, there is a consultant who has a practice in New York City selling audiophile tweak style soundproofing things to people with zillion dollar apartments in Manhattan. And they come in and they put up some stuff that, you know, like, maybe would get you a point of isolation and they charge a lot of money but because you've this, you, you ha now have the, the, the I spent a million dollars. This sounds perfect. This is great. Yay, confirmation bias. If you want to buy a million dollar acoustic placebo, you can do that. They sell them. <laughs> um, but to do this well, it's all detail. It's all, you know, if you screw up 2%, you've just put the floor of your isolation at 40 dB. You know, with the 2% screw up, the 1% screw up, you know, maybe you can get to 60, but you're, yeah, you're getting sketchy then. You know, the, the level of isolation you need to get audible differences, because your ears are logarithmic receivers, is uh, you need to make logarithmic changes to get results. And, you know, going, you know, buying a, you know, 10 times as much drywall to get a 20 dB improvement. It's no fun.
uh, you know, people people buy like stuff. They spend a lot of money. They put things things in places to say, why didn't it get any better? It's like, well, it did. It got three dB better. <laughs> you know, you, you cut the sound power in half. It's three dB better. You've done a massive improvement in the raw sound power in the space. It doesn't sound like much, but you know, that's your fault. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Um, a while back, uh, and I'm sure you saw the thing of the, you guys made like a hoverboard skateboard thing. That was oh, yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah, you know, uh, repulsion, but their main application that was their like sort of show off the technology. Mm -hmm. Their main application was using those as building risers to replace like earthquake proofing springs. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any, uh, any look into like using that kind of thing to float a floor. What happens if the power goes out? I assume there's a backup spring. Well, if you're going to have a backup spring, why not just put a spring in there that does it? <laughs> I mean, I've seen entire concert halls put on this kind of stuff. Like, you know, I, I, I get to have a, I did a tour of the new, uh, I can forget the name of it because it's in French and I'm an ignorant American, but the new concert hall in Montreal. I did a tour of it while I was under construction. And you could go in the basement and see where the entire concert hall was sitting on these like giant slabs of neoprene and then a big slab of metal and then a big slab of neoprene. And the whole hall, the whole damn thing is like, just floated on these things. We've done stuff uh, for schools near subway lines where we floated the whole building. Um, vibration sensitive labs near trains float the whole building. It can be done. Um, and it's horrifically expensive. Yeah? How does this stuff hold up like 20 years later? I mean, you have to rip it all out and replace it. Neoprene is a bizarrely resilient material. Um, like, like the ones in that, in the concert hall, technically they're designed so you can chainsaw through one, pull it out, and then cram in a pre-compressed other one, and then let it go boink into the space. Um, as far as I know, no one has ever done that. Because neoprene just doesn't, I mean, as long as you don't overload it, you've you know, done your math up front, it just lasts it lasts and lasts and lasts. And people have been, so at some point, maybe all of these schools are going to go bloop into the ground. Um, I'll be dead. It'll be fine. And <laughs> then we'll know how long they last for. But people have only been doing this kind of stuff for 50 years. And so far, you know, steel and concrete and neoprene last 50 years. That's fine. Um, at some point, I'm sure they'll all break. Uh, but it's more likely to get torn down for condos before then. So it's, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yep. Rubber balls, uh, inner tubes, that kind of a thing. And what's, what's the deal with those? Just some suspended, yeah, a floor of sort of rubber ball thing. You could. Well, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, that's basic. you know, well, I mean, these things, the things that are under that are in fact called pucks. <laughs> You know, and balls are, they roll, so it's, but if you make a square block. You, but that's solid, it's not like. No, it, it, well, so th th this, is, this is rubber wrapped around a fiberglass core, so this is not, it's, it's, it's solid if you do this, but if you put a whole floor, you know, floor worth of weight on top of it, it's, squ it's squishy enough. Yeah. Um, so you could do, there are, I've seen for mechanical equipment, like rooftop equipment, air springs, where it's basically an inner tube. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and you put, you pressurize the spring, and there's a little, and you have to come back every so often and, and, and test the pressure. And if it's going down, you have to pump it back up. Uh, I've never seen a room done on air springs, but I've definitely seen like multi-ton mechanical air handling equipment put on air springs. It's probably worth mentioning that um, any of these things, you can't just kind of get something rubbery and springy and put it under there and hope it's going to work. Buddy used the disc stuff on his studio. I mm -hmm. think, you know, we yeah. see this all the time where it's like, well, that was because 
he put this much weight on it and it's a whole different studio. So you can, yeah. I mean, you if can't you, just be like, rubber, I'm done. Yeah. I mean, if you take a spring or a piece of rubber and you don't put enough weight on it, it doesn't compress at all and it acts like a solid piece of metal. If you put too much weight on it, it pancakes all the way down and turns into a solid piece of metal. So you need to make sure the springiness of whatever you're using is balanced so that it goes down some without pancaking. Uh, and that's not hard to do, but you do have to like either look in catalogs or and do a little bit of math. Uh, so, you know, don't just guess. So you gotta factor like the weight of what you're doing and then the weight of someone actually coming in and using the facilities. Well, I mean, by the point you've poured four inches of concrete, the weight of the people doesn't matter too much. The weight of an inch of like thousand miles. Might, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're putting like big things in, then that's something you need to figure in. But for for the live load, for the people walking around, it's, you know, hopefully they weigh less than four inches of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> they might be huge. They might be like, you know, 100 feet tall. Or... We can't have all of the New England Patriots in our studio at the same time because the floor is not Yeah. How yep. do you connect the wall to the ceiling without it? Making you flanking. Oh, that's exciting. So what you do, um, going to make you pictures. Uh, so you, uh, Get your floor, your structural floor, whoop, and then you float your isolation slab on top of that on your sp springs. And then you build your wall on the edge of the slab. And then up here somewhere you have like, say it's concrete deck, the structural ceiling. You run your studs up to the structural ceiling and they will sell you a little resilient grommet you can use to attach that so it doesn't fall off, you know, so the wall doesn't tip over. And then you come in and you put your ceiling in which is also hanging on springs. Springs. <laughs> They're spring isolators. They're just springs. Um, and then you go around. So they never do this right. No, they don't, not, not never, but we always put this in the detail and it sometimes happens and it usually doesn't. Like recording studios, they'll pay, pay attention, but like any, like a regular building, you yeah. So what you do is you build this so there's, you know, half to a quarter inch air gap at the edge here, and then you fill, seal that with a, you know, resilient, usually silicone caulk. So the seal here is bouncy, so the ceiling can flex and the wall can flex, and they don't necessarily, I mean, you lose some, no matter what. I mean, just having, you have to bridge that at some point. Um, but that's a lot better than, you know, taking the framing of this and hard screwing it into these studs. You have to do that for the whole scene. Yep. And you should see the stuff that can go wrong caulking. Um, yeah. Oh. You know, there's, there's a proper way to caulk, which is not necessarily obvious. Um, because, again, depending on temperature and things, as it pulls apart, there's a lot of ways that that caulking can fail. Uh, and a lot of times just put a little bit, little round, like, tube of stuff that you can put in there that better... That Back a rod. Beyond, <coughs> ...beyond the scope of this. But yeah. even caulking can be screwed up. Yeah. So you got to do that right. You got to... Uh, yes. I just had a quick question, and I, I feel like it's oh. relying on environmental uh, aspects. But yeah. You had mentioned, we were talking about, like, studs and stuff for the walls. Like yes. The uh, would you go with metal or wood, or is that... The Metal's better. Area? Metal is better. Metal, just... Okay. Metal's better. That's for hanging things though. Right. So if you want it to stay up, like the thing that I'm finding is 
people have done metal stud wall and you can't hang a full acoustic of treatment on it because it's too heavy. So well, I mean, you know, that's where you get back to structural engineering. I mean, you can get, you can get right. heavier gauge studs, but yeah. it's the same thing. You need to match your construction to the weight you are putting on it. And, and metal studs can be very strong in one direction and very weak in another direction. Yeah. So it depends on what order you put them and all that. Some planning and some structural Ke Kevin has been trying to... <laughs> Kevin. I was just asking curious about the second wall would go into this. Would it be oh, so from the ceiling the same way? So the, the second wall would go on the building floor and then you'd come up to the structural ceiling and you'd seal hard airtight to the structural ceiling. So you're building an airtight box around your floating box. And then the um, control room, live room situation, just both rooms would float? Right? Yeah, so in that case you would have a second floated slab. Yeah, so this could be like control room, this could be live room. And so these are not contiguous and there's a, a gap. Why would they both need to be floated? Because, um, well, if you want to be able to rock out on both sides of the wall, you need to isolate both rooms. Um, and then you can, I mean, there's still going to be some transfer from here into the floor and across. So you get, you know, a lot more isolation if both of these are independently flo floated from each other. Yeah. Could you commonly have two different HVAC systems, one with a separate one for each room? Yes. Yeah. Or alternately, I mean, generally, the, I mean, these, the other thing is when you seal a room up like this, it's airtight. So you have, so if you don't work out some way to get fresh air in, people just die. <laughs> um, but putting fresh air in means putting a big frickin' hole in the wall. So there's a whole separate, I mean, I could, I could do this whole talk over again on HVAC sound isolation. That, that gets, and you, I mean, and you talk about expensive for walls, you know, building out two separate mechanical systems with fully lined ductwork and uh, silencers on everything, and a lot of money. Uh, I, did, I did a studio for Reebok, which they're about to tear down because they decided to move downtown, even though the studio is like three years old, um, where... You know, it's like a mixed, like, audio, video. They're, they're, all their in-house media gets done in this facility. And it had to be s silent. No sound. And so I designed a hell of an air system, if I may say so myself. You know, it's supposed to come out about, like, 10 dBA SPL. So, you know, like, very quiet. Um, and they built it. And I went to go visit. Like, and it was so loud. Like, oh my God. You spent like $100,000 on silencers. Why is it so loud? <laughs> They'd put like 50 LED lights on the grid, and each LED light had a fan in it. <laughs> and if you shut, the, shut all the lights off, it was beautiful. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, this, this is quiet. But they're never going to shut the lights off because they're always going to be doing stuff with them. So it's always going to be like 40 dBA in there because, you know, lights, man, you've got to have lights. <laughs> and they have to have fans. I don't know that about the LEDs. Um, LEDs lights get super hot. So you either need a big honking heat sink to cool them passively. But most of them just have uh, like, a, like a CPU fan on them. They just... So then it's not, then they're not, they're not efficient. I mean, well, I mean, it, well, if you compare the heat output of like stage, uh, like you know, halogen stage lights oh, yeah. to LED stage lights, yeah. it's way, way less. Yeah. But the issue is, is that if the if, if the if the the little liquid crystal gets as hot as it will, if you're putting that much wattage through it, mm -hmm. um, it just dies. Mm -hmm. So it's way cooler than an incandescent light or a fluorescent or any of those others. But it's too hot for the, 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 the LED to survive. 
So you have to add some kind of, you know, cooling. Yeah, well you can do, which, which is expensive. So they just put like a, like a you know, 15 cent CPU fan on the, on the back and off yeah. you go. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I keep hearing you go through the, the math and the problems, and I keep thinking that there's a punchline, which is where you tell us how to do it easily. No, I mean. <laughs> it isn't, it just gets worse and worse. It does, I'm, you know. I mean, I have so many architects say, but why can't we make this work? Right. And it's like, physics? <laughs> I mean, physics does not care about your design goals. I mean, you know, mass law is mass law. Um, it just, it's, it's all logarithmic and it's all gonna suck. <laughs> Except if you, go ahead. <laughs> Except if you own the company that makes the drywall. Yeah. <laughs> then it's awesome. Yeah, Yep. So I just had a quick question about, because uh, we're talking about building walls and all We're building walls, yeah. How do things like Adobe bricks come into play? Well, I don't know. In ter like, just like, are they like practical? I've seen some. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you, you know, like if you wanted to see what they're probably doing. I guess what my question is, yep. is how do natural materials uh, work for isolation? Gypsum's a natural material. You dig it out of the ground. Uh, I mean, you can take anything you want. And build a wall out of it in, te in a test chamber and test what the, what the isolation is. Um, a lot of those cases, though, where they're doing like a fancy, you know, finish surface, behind the finish surface is three or four layers of drywall. Right. You know, and they put something pretty in the front. Right. But it's usually, you know, in terms of mass per dollar, either liquid concrete or you know, precast drywall, which is basically the same thing, um, is the cheapest mass per dollar. And you can use anything you want, but it's the mass law again. So you have to have it stiff and heavy. And if you're going to buy stiffness and heaviness, buy concrete. Yeah. Um, so when you mentioned having the drywall with two, two pieces on one side, two on the other, yep. or having four and five, Yep. Would it make sense to have two and three, or is that? Yeah, okay. that'll be a little better. Now, the two, the two and three, you'll get a notable change at that dip frequency because you change, you now have two different panel resonances, but the overall curve is just going to move like, boop. So if you have a wall and you know it's there's a hole in it and in, in you know hole in the response, you want to fill that hole. Doing doing the odd thing can like smooth that out. But as far as the overall isolation of the wall, you know, adding half a layer will get you like two or three dB. Yeah. Just uh, as far as this goes, adding a third wall on that application for the, say the live room is the one on your on mm -hmm. the right, just, is that still commonly ever used or beneficial in this? What do you mean by that? Because that other wall is coupled to the ceiling. Oh, well, I mean, if you're going to float both, you would also have something resilient up here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then therefore, maybe a third wall is not really... Well, really I mean, helpful. the thing is, at that point, the, the, the thing that will be... At that point, high frequencies are fixed. Mm -hmm. It's base. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you need more base absorption, you just can move them farther apart. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm not even saying between rooms, but outside, like, rain or a helicopter or something outside. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you can put... A heavier structural ceiling that that up, you know, those are all things that get done. The uh, I saw a project <coughs> that resulted in a horrific lawsuit. Horrific. Um, I you know the story is heartbreaking and it involves one of my favorite people, so I won't get too into it. Not me. Um, but somebody wanted. To they 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 said they were doing uh, an ADR studio for film, and they would do some music in it sometimes. So they built a studio and it was floated, and they built an ADR room and it was floated, and there was a you know big you know fancy glass window and so you could look through and like wave at the person, and uh, it was great, great. It was like you know STC eighty. It was great, real nice wall, and then they moved in. And somebody went into the, the voiceover room with a kick drum. 
and played a kick drum as loud as they could, and then went back into the control room and they could still hear it. To which the answer is, well, yeah. Um, some other consultant got brought in, said the original design was flawed, and they ended up tearing all the, con tore the whole thing out and rebuilt it where there was the booth, a whole nother frickin' room, like a 12-foot air gap, and then the control room. And, and then uh, uh, closed circuit video back and forth instead of windows, which, you know, they couldn't hear the kick drum anymore. Uh, this was very surprising to the person who to was told to design a ADR room that will occasionally have some music recorded in it. Uh, there was a lawsuit. Uh, the client sued. The con contractor sued. The consultant sued. You know, uh, like weeks of depositions. You know, like people's entire like as long as they had worked at the company email read through for, you know, proof. Um, uh, the, that, that friend does not, uh, does not do that kind of work anymore. Uh, believe it or not, it's soured him on consulting. Uh, <coughs> brilliant person, like really one, like one of the smartest acoustical minds I know. And he's just like, nope, I'm doing different stuff now because this is bullshit. And uh, you know, a three million dollar lawsuit will you know, ch change your mind about a thing. Uh, I carry, you know, this, this, as a company, Ascentech carries millions of dollars in liability insurance, which we don't use. We haven't had to use it, but it's, you know, if you screw up a 30-story building and they have to re-drywall the whole building and not open it for another six months because they're re-drywalling the whole building, that's a lot of liability. Um, and we haven't screwed it up like that yet. <laughs> but if that day ever comes, uh, we have a gargantuan liability policy. And anyone who's doing this work um, on big projects who is not carrying at least a million dollars of liability insurance is playing with fire. Is it, yeah. A lighter hearted question. Uh, what are we sitting on? Chairs. <laughs> Next. Is there anything below us? That Carpet. Um, no, uh, continuous slab right across. Uh, the walls are double stud walls. Um, you know, this was this this is is a conference room, not a recording studio. Though I have recorded albums in this room. Um, the uh, I've recorded albums in the reverb chamber. The but yeah, it's you know. We had a budget. This is an office. We needed a conference room. Uh, it's a really nice conference room, but we weren't putting in like a four million dollar concert co conference room. We eat lunch in here like a couple times a week. That's you know the general usage of this room. <laughs> yep. Um, when I was building my room, I got sold on the half inch drywall and the five eighths inch yep. drywall um, combo. Side. Yeah. Are you a believer in that to mix up the resonance? It is an eighth of an inch thicker. I mean, like the one resonates at a different frequency than the other. By the other. time you've glued and screwed the wall the layers together, that's an eighth of an inch thicker. I mean, you know, it's now if you did like half and half and half and five eighths, different. Mm -hmm. But the resonance of five eighths and a half laminated together and the resonance of five eighths and a half laminated together is going to be the same. I mean, it, it, it might get you a point. It might get you two points. But it's wee, teeny tiny. Yeah? In addition to the fuzzy stuff, is there any sort of materials to fill that work better, specifically sand or something like that, that should be pretty lossy? Uh, sand is too, st yeah, I mean, the thing is that, that fuzz is not to add loss. It's to damp the resonance in there. Um, if you put something like sand in, it's stiff enough that you're now coupling the layers together. 
so you, you've gone from having two separate things to having a thicker partition with a layer of sand as part of the mass of the partition. So, so keeping airspace is the most lossy way to... Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, two rooms levitating in an infinite space with nothing touching anything in is in a vacuum. <laughs> and we're all dead. Um, you can pressurize the room, though. That'll be fine. But this... Uh, you know, what's doing the work here it, is the air gap and the, the pucks are a necessary compromise so the room doesn't fall, fall down. Yeah. I mean, the perfect thing would be no pucks, just this floating two inches over the slab. But you have to put, attach it somewhere. What is that called, that material? Um, this, oh Jesus. What's this damn thing called? No, the, the assembly. Oh, the assembly. It's the rim. Rim, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's the, you know, it's R-I-M. Um, who makes the, that Kinetics. thing? Kinetics, yeah. I know that sometimes. Um, not right now. You mean you don't remember every product from every company all the time? I don't remember anything ever about anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of horrific. <laughs> you know, people, like, ask me questions about, like, anything with a name. Like, I remember physics. I know how the, the universe works. But if you ask me, like, what do you think about, you know, microphone, you know, 123X? It's like, yeah, that's a microphone. Or, you know, pro I, I, product names, vendor names, <coughs> band names, people names. I don't, I don't, dates. I don't do discrete facts. These are not things my brain is wired for. Um, but I carry Wikipedia in my pants, which is incredibly helpful. You, you, you would love to know the things I have done in these pants. But there are young people present, so we can't get into that. Let's go eat pizza. I'll be eating pizza if you want to ask me more questions. I'll have, I'll have my mouth full, but I can still talk. Thank you very much.